we've been talking about infinite series and the question of whether an infinite series converges or diverges. Now we're going to talk about what's called conditionally convergent infinite series. Up till now we've been used to asking the question, does this series converge? And then the god of mathematics tells us no or yes. And that's, those are the only two answers that we've seen. But now we're going to have a type of series where if you ask, does this series converge? The answer is sort of maybe, and there are some cases when it converges. That's a conditionally convergent series, and I want to understand what a conditionally convergent series is. So let's start out by reviewing the idea of what it means to say a series is divergent. Here is the harmonic series, and we know this series to be divergent. And what I mean by that is if I look at the partial sums, like 1.5, that's the sum of the first two terms, or 2.08333, or if you sum more terms, you get 2.71786, or 3.38. This sequence of partial sums is going to grow arbitrarily large. And what we mean by that is if you name any arbitrarily large number, I can find some number of terms that adds up to more than that number. And we know this to be true. One of the ways we know it to be true is by comparing it to this sequence that has one one-half, two quarters, four eighths, eight one-sixteenths, and so on. And if we compare these term by term, we can see that each term in the blue sequence is less than or equal to the corresponding term in the black sequence. And that means that any partial sum of the blue sequence must be smaller than the corresponding partial sum in the black sequence. But there's a subsequence of these partial sums that forms an arithmetic sequence of common difference one-half. And we know that that arithmetic sequence has terms that get arbitrarily large. Therefore, if you name any number, no matter how large it is, I can find some number of terms in the blue series that add up to more than the number you named. And therefore, the same number of terms in the black series must also add up to more than the number you named. And that is our rock-solid proof that the harmonic series is divergent. It, and it's divergent because it grows arbitrarily large. And if somebody were to argue that they don't believe that that's convergent, then they would be struck down by the logic of mathematics. Now let's remind ourselves of why an alternating series is convergent. Here's the harmonic series, but it's the alternating version, the alternating harmonic series. And we can show that this is convergent by drawing a graph of the partial sums. The first partial sum is just one, the first term. So I'll put a dot over there at a level one. When I add the second term to get the second partial sum, I'm going to go down by one half of a unit. So I go down by a half to get s sub 2, the second partial sum. And then to put in the next partial sum, I have to go up by a third of a unit. But a third has a smaller magnitude than a half, because the magnitudes of these terms are monotonically decreasing. So my step up from the second term to the third term has got to be smaller than my step down from the first term to the second term. And my step down from the third term to the fourth term is smaller still. So that means that my second term has got to be a lower bound for all of the rest of the terms. The third term's an upper bound for all of the rest of the terms after it. So the question is, do these partial sums eventually converge to a single number indicated by the green dashed line? And they do. One way to show it is to uh, consider the subsequence of S4, S6, S8, S10, and so on, the ones I just circled in blue. That's a monotonically increasing sequence, and it's bounded above by the value of S3. At the same time, the sequence S5, 7, 9, 11, and so on is bounded below by the value of S4. So we have an increasing sequence bounded above must be convergent, and decreasing sequence bounded below must be convergent. And these both have to converge to the same value because the difference between a pair of successive terms is going to go to zero. The difference between a pair of successive terms of the partial sum is the value of a sub n, and that goes to zero. Therefore, 
That proves that this series, the alternating harmonic series, must be a convergent series. But it's not merely a convergent series. It's a conditionally convergent series. So what do we mean by that? Well, let me show you something that will undermine your confidence in whether this series converges. Okay, we can we can add up this series on the calculator. 499 terms, 500 terms, 501 terms. We could start getting an idea for what the numbers look like. And you'd have to add up a lot more terms to get more decimal places, but you could get a pretty good guess of where it's going to converge if you notice that it's going back and forth pretty evenly around limiting value. So if instead of subtracting 502, which would be the next term, we subtract half of that, then we'll get a much better estimate. And, and maybe we'll notice that that number is familiar. It's the natural log of 2. In fact, this series does sum to the natural log of 2, and in a couple of weeks I'm going to show you why that is true. But for now, just take my word for it. it. It does add up to the natural log of 2, and even if you don't believe me, that, that doesn't affect the argument that follows. So let's say that the alternating harmonic series adds up to natural log of 2. Now I'm going to manipulate the series by just changing the order of the terms. I'm just going to mix up the order a little bit. And you know that addition is commutative, so I should be able to just change the order of summation and not affect the sum. As long as I'm adding up all the terms, I'm going to put two negative terms and then one positive term, and then the next two negative terms, and then the next positive term. So my negative terms are moving up and my positive terms are moving back, but I'm not leaving any out. I'm still adding the same infinite series and all of the terms are going to be accounted for. Presumably this will add up to natural log of 2 because it's just rearranging the terms of an addition problem. Next, I'm going to pair the numbers and collapse two terms into one. So 1 minus a half is a half, a third minus a sixth is a sixth, and, and so on. And I'm left with a series in which every term has a factor of a half in it. So I'll factor out the one half, and the new series that appears in parentheses turns out to be identical to the original series that we were adding that we said was natural log of 2. So I'll replace that with natural log of 2, and I get the result that one half of natural log of 2 is equal to natural log of 2. Well, it can't be. What happened was, when we rearranged the order of the terms, the series summed to a different value. This is a startling discovery for most people, because it seems like we're saying that addition is not commutative for an infinite series. It's conditionally convergent series that have this property. When you have a conditionally convergent series, the order of the terms in the series determines the value that it sums to. You can find, in principle, some ordering of the terms to make the series sum to any value you want. So, the next question you're probably asking is, how can you tell whether a series is conditionally convergent or absolutely convergent. So let me show you a little animation that will give you a clue. If I take this series and I separate out every other term so that the positive terms and the negative terms are separated into two separate series, I see the positive terms are a divergent series of positive constants. They add up to infinity. And the negative terms, another divergent. They add up to negative infinity. So when I was putting them together and adding up the entire series, I was really adding infinity plus negative infinity. And you know that infinity plus negative infinity is an indeterminate form. It could be any number. This is the reason why the alternating harmonic series can add up to any number depending on the order of the terms. Let's contrast this with a series that's not conditionally convergent. Here's a series that's absolutely convergent. I'll put little twos there, and I have the sum of the reciprocals of the squares of the integers. This is the p equals 2 alternating p series. We can show that this series is convergent using the same reasoning that we used with the alternating harmonic series. The difference is that this is not a conditionally convergent series. This is an absolutely convergent series. And why is that true? Well, if I separate out the positive and negative terms in the same way, 
then the positive constants don't add up to infinity, they add up to pi squared over 8. And the negative constants add up to negative pi squared over 24. And pi squared over 8 minus pi squared over 24 is not an indeterminate form. It's always equal to pi squared over 6. That means no matter what order you add the terms in, they will add up to pi squared over 6. <coughs> so let's summarize this. When we looked at the harmonic, the alternating harmonic series, we, we found the series itself was convergent. But if we added the absolute value of the terms up, we would get a divergent series. In other words, 1 minus a half plus a third minus a fourth and so on is convergent, but 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth and so on is divergent. And by contrast, if we looked at the alternating p equals 2p series, we found that the sum of the series was convergent, and also the sum of the absolute values of the terms was convergent. In other words, 1 minus a quarter plus a ninth minus a sixteenth is convergent, and also 1 plus a quarter plus a ninth plus a sixteenth is convergent. And this is the clue that gives us the rule for how to determine conditional convergence. Here's the rule. If the sum of the absolute value of the terms in an infinite series is convergent, then we say that that series is absolutely convergent. And if the sum of the absolute value of the terms is divergent, then we say that the series is conditionally convergent. Or maybe it doesn't converge at all. We'd say it's divergent. So you can take this as a definition of absolute convergence and conditional convergence. So let's end with one final example. The series sine of 1 over 1 plus sine of 2 over 4 plus sine of 3 over 9 plus sine of 4 over 16 and so on. Is this a convergent series? You might have an intuition that it is convergent because it sort of looks like the p equals 2p series. The denominators are, are n squared and the numerators are things that just go around between negative 1 and 1. But how do you prove using these theorems that it is convergent? Well, first of all, let's identify the general term that's being added up. Sine of n over n squared is the general term. Next, let's define a new series whose terms are the absolute value of the terms in the first series, so that we have a series of positive constants. A series of positive constants can be addressed using the comparison test because I can come up with another series of positive constants, c sub n equals 1 over n squared, that can be compared with b sub n. b sub n is always less than or equal to c sub n, since the sine function has a magnitude at most 1. So we can say that the sum of b sub n converges by comparison with the p equals 2p series. And therefore, since it's the sum of the absolute value of a sub n converges, we can say that the sum of a sub n converges absolutely. And when a series converges absolutely, then that series must be convergent. And we've shown that the series is convergent.